just you know never know when uh <laughs> never know when the kino is gonna flow so anyways uh man where do i start it's one of those things where it's like i don't even know where to start you know what i mean <laughs> but, <laughs> but i guess um for those who don't know my i know it's kind of stupid uh pretending there's an audience but for those who don't know the great the almighty alexander adams artist writer um man man who uh is out for um to win my heart but you know anyways <laughs> but, Gio, um, giant broadcaster it's good to be with you it's thank good you to be for with asking you. me on oh yeah man. i feel like um i feel like this will probably be like the first of many appearances um we have a lot in common right down to our style but uh I wanted to, uh, I, I guess, maybe introduction. I uh, I know people, see, here's the thing. And I don't know, maybe it's just my perspective. But it seems that a lot of people, they when they bring you on, they want, you know, which is true. I mean, everyone does. We want the hot takes, you know, the hot, hot takes. Contemporary art world. But, um, but I, I know that when it comes to your own body of work, like being a writer, you know, and a hot take man myself, your own work sort of like gets lost in the equation. So I wanted to focus more on that before we go into a bit of the politics of it, I guess from a different way than your usual, um, because I, I know that uh, two, two really good books that you've come out with is of course, Artivism and the one I have, which is Culture War, which I wanted to get into a little bit because I am, I myself am writing a book about art and aesthetics recently uh, and a book which deals with culture war stuff. Before we get into this, let's get into your early education. Let's get into, um, yeah, let's get into like from art school up until um, your time at uh, Goldsmith, right? So, yeah. yeah well, well, thanks for asking. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I went into I went into Goldsmith. I kind of got in. I kind of, which at the time was, it was considered the best art department in Europe or the world. It depends who depended who yeah. you asked. But it was it had a very high reputation. It had just oh, yeah. um, produced um, Damien Hirst and a whole bunch of other artists, including a painter I really admire called um, Glenn Brown. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So and 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 a whole bunch of other people who were involved in the Young British Art Movement. Mm. Um, so it was it was on a high. It was uh, had a very high reputation around the early nineties. So I applied in ninety one. I was accepted in ninety one, and I entered. Um, yeah, I guess I I either accept, I either applied in ninety one or ninety two, and I actually uh, was accepted and went in in ninety two, but I kind of got in through the back door. So you see, they had um, they had two courses if you wanted to do fine art. They had straight fine art, which was very very highly competitive, very difficult to yeah. get into, yeah. and then they had a slightly lesser known one, which was called art history and fine art. So you would do half of your course would be history of art, so you'd be reading and writing about um art that had previously been made and then the other half of the time you'd be sitting in your studio paralyzed by doubt questioning whether or not you could do or say anything meaningful um, and that yeah. was the course i got in on because there was slightly less competition uh, actually as it turned out it really suited me because obviously now i'm half writer half um half artist so um it kind of suited me so so that's how i got into goldsmiths which is in situated in uh, south london uh, mm -hmm. in Britain. Yeah, and of course now it's known primarily as like the top theory cell uh school as well where a lot of like well Mark Fisher hung around those parts, right? So that's yeah, uh there's a lot of people that either want to be in Goldsmith or like have come up around like uh even like the CCRU, like a lot of that type of writing. But in the arts program, I mean, basically the haven of like the the YBA um uh, but let me ask you though, um, what what was your take on the YBA at the time, and what was your sort of like doing something that is contemporary but yet still with the like you're within the figurative tradition? Yeah. Um, I'm I'm a great fan of Damien Hirst. Um, I I have sympathies towards most of the YBA, which is like very shocking to most people. But you know, but what was your gauge at the time? I was born in '92, by the way. You got into college in '92. I was born in '92. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, make me feel old. Thank you, Joe. Um, but I just turned thirty, so I feel old and uh, 
Okay. In other ways. You're not you're an honorary old man at 30. Yeah, man. the 30 year old boomer as they call it. So. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, so at the time I was kind of I guess I was half half sort of snobbishly disdainful and then half uh, mm. uh, eaten up with envy because they'd actually made a really big splash. They'd uh, kind of cleared away the new sculpture movement from the 1970s and 1980s. They'd come oh, yeah. in, they were fresh, they were bright, they used contemporary imagery, they were snappy, they painted big, so they were sort of coming on the sort of from the neo-expressionists, the German neo and American neo-expressionists. So they had ambition. They got their stuff seen. They got it bought by the Saatchi, by Charles Saatchi, and mm. ended up in the Saatchi collection. Um, so I was hugely admiring of that. Um, the, the the content, uh, less so, less made less of an impression, less interesting on me for me. But yeah, I mean, I did have a lot of sympathy with uh, Damien Hurst and Mark Quinn. Mm. And yeah. there was uh, Richard Wilson who did an installation in the original Saatchi Gallery, which is actually the only one I know. I think it closed down in the mid 90s, late 90s. It opened in something like 89 and closed in the late 90s. And that's the only one I've seen that I think there have been two since then. And he did an installation where it was kind of like um, you walked out in a little sort of. Um, little sort of gangway and you were surrounded all sides by some oil which went oh, right up to the edge that one. Yeah. Yeah, of, the, of the walls in this gallery space so it acted like a mirror so it's like a really dark mirror mm. um and it was it was quite a it's quite a sort of disconcerting um uh, thing to be part of you, you, can, you, you can see it in photos but it doesn't really work unless you're actually there and i had a great admiration for that sort of stuff and there were a few bits and pieces that i saw at the Saatchi gallery that really excited me but um yeah so I, I had kind of mixed feelings and obviously i wanted to be as successful as them but um i i think it, it was kind of uh, anyone who came up after them and really wanted to emulate them which was basically half of everyone yeah. was a country, yeah uh, they kind of misfired they kind of fell between the gaps um they would have been better off doing their own thing um, mm. that's how i see it but in, in a way, it was sort of like restoring the legacy of the city of London in the in the art world because like New York had dominated for oh, so yeah. many decades, ten centuries. Yeah, that, yeah, the, 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 point, the, yeah. yeah, the the YBAs and and you'll find this criticism quite widely is that basically a lot of their stuff was they'd essentially spend a lot of time looking at Freeze and Art Forum and yeah. they all reproductions yeah. <laughs> of American American conceptual stuff like sort of Dan Graham and and uh, Charles Ray and stuff like that. And all of that stuff was in those magazines and they were kind of like um, either copying or emulating or referring to this sort of stuff. Um, and that's what they were doing. So, yeah, I mean, it was it was it was it was kind of a, a way of making it British and appropriating it and putting your own spin on things. Um, but it was very much influenced yeah. by American art. Making it posh and poppy and that that's sort of the British style that was come to know. But yeah. like I. I well, the, Damien Hirst, I mean, I really loved, same with Mark Quinn, it's sort of like the meditation of mortality and death. And, but I, I guess like he really played the kayfabe heel of the art world. And I think that's why, you know, to use a wrestling term, that's probably why like he's gotten so much infamy because I mean, at the end of the day, you could say, well, it's a shark in a tank or it's polka dots or it's, you know, a, a decaying cow's head with flies. But there's something conceptually there that i always found exciting and interesting oh, it's, but, it's, it's beautifully yeah. it's beautifully concise and i remember and this has been confirmed by other sources but i remember a, a, a painter friend of mine went to the Saatchi gallery i went to the Saatchi gallery where that was the head was first exhibited mm. uh, the cow's head and he he kind of and being a painter of course he knew he recognized mm -hmm. when francis bacon went up That's right. and had a look at this head and my painter friend was quite sort of idealistic and he said well what do you think and um, he'd never met francis bacon but you, you knew him from photos and he and francis bacon said well you know uh, i think i think it's quite good you know and um, <laughs> of course you would say that yeah. yeah and but obviously damien Hurst was taking a lot from francis bacon but you know like yeah. the, the the clarity the preciseness the tidiness of the vitrine it, it's very it goes very well with something quite messy so you have the the messiness is accentuated by the clean lines and the clean lines are accentuated by the messiness so it's quite a it's quite a it's like when you put complementary colors together it sort of emphasizes exactly. each, each aspect so it works yeah. really well so i i really like some of those early stuff um that, oh yeah uh, Hurst did. 
But what what also like it, it seems also the YBA, but also I guess contemporary art in the late nineties, two thousand going into the two thousands, the whole like thing about relational aesthetics was so very big. And I think even nowadays, I mean, the negotiation of space and the creation of space, even like you could say, Hearst was trying to capture a life moment within a gallery setting. And so like, what do you make of that? I mean, both of us are painters and printmakers, and so we're kind of different, but I, I always thought it was very interesting how space itself, like, and here I'm kind of thinking of Sarah, of course, like space itself becomes the conduit of the work of art. And I know a lot of people like the criticism is that while well, it's cheap and you're just like guiding people into rooms or whatnot, or, you know, I mean, I guess you have like the more Instagrammable uh, Kusama, like infinity rooms or whatnot, mm -hmm. but it seems like the negotiation of, of place and space and location became like really big and like the attention towards space is something. And I think it's quite interesting, like, cause now we live in the world of the non-place and it's like we're no nothing. I think it's a chapter in my book. It's gonna be titled "Nothing and Nowhere." So it's like you know. But what do you what do you make of like as, as someone who's more within the fine arts tradition yourself? Like it's yeah, relational aesthetics. I guess. Well, it, it it's really. I remember being um, really stimulated by the the Carl Andre pieces because you could see quite a oh, lot yeah. of that in Britain, and obviously that was a big in america at the time as well so you had like sort of you know the tiles and you'd have people walking over the tiles and and then you'd have the stacks of wood and stuff and then sarah of course is um you know the, those there's a really quite a large charge to being around slabs of metal that are one ton heavy and they're and they're tilting yeah. and you know i mean you could throw yourself at it and and it wouldn't move of course of course you you understand that intellectually but just in terms of your your viscer, in terms of your 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 body, your body is is tense because you are scared because that that stuff's heavy. It will if it falls on you, it will kill you. And actually, there was the they were setting up an an installation of Sarah, and something slipped, something went wrong, and and a guy was oh, actually killed uh, during the setup of one of those. So they have they have quite a, quite a lot of potency. Um, and I know I know people were looking a lot. I, I remember my tutor. Uh, was a painter Lisa Milroy but she was quite open to uh non-painterly stuff and she said you know she'd just seen a great exhibition in Paris I think where someone had taken all of the plinths from Brancusi sculptures and had just exhibited the plinths so it made you kind of aware of the, the the shape of these plinths but also what was missing you know you were you were mentally sort of placing something on top of this sculpture because you know you were kind of you were looking at the empty space above the sculpture um, mm. And that's that was another aspect, but I also I think it, it relates to Dan Graham and Dan Graham's sort of like his his boxed installations, his glazed installations and stuff. So he's just sort of basically boxing nothing, and you were looking you were looking at all these sort of walls and the vitrines and the framework and stuff, which is obviously uh, picked up by Damien Hurst and so on. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And, well, and then Brent's... of course, and then of course, you got the Gerhard Richter um, um, panes of glass. Where you yeah. had like a row of panes yeah. of glass and they're kind of like all tilted at different angles um i guess that's something related yeah oh yeah definitely like i mean i i think it's interesting how um like like space itself becomes that i mean of course even within within the within the painting you have rothko and so forth but like brancusi is interesting because he does take the naturalistic form and and the way he like negotiates the space of the human body in into something that is harmonious with the nature around it like i guess that's probably what was very interesting i remember like watching documentaries about richard Serra, how he would draw afterwards after the installation was done he would do sketches of it. and i always thought that was a very interesting almost counterintuitive approach to it because then when you have the the work within a living space of now you're drawing it now you're trying to figure it through through you know, through the medium of drawing, which I found very interesting. And of course, the way he would draw would, you know, he would take charcoal and these like huge, um, you know, huge mounds of pastel and would like work them in. But, but I always thought that was very interesting how, um, and also the visceral reaction to it, you know, especially to land art because people think it's non-art. And so like the infamous example of the leaning, the leaning wall in Chicago. Um, and of course, you know, recently, uh, the, I think almost near it, they had like the the Martin Luther King, the the, <laughs> the, oh, the, the recent yeah. one, yeah, yeah. 
Ooh. And they should have never gotten rid of Richard Serra's piece, The Wall. Instead, they replaced it with the uh, with what was his wife's name that he kept cheating on. What was her name? Winnie? I forget. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, am I wrong in thinking that Tilted Arc was actually in New York? Sorry, was Tilted Arc? No, it was in Chicago, I think. Oh, there, there, well, there may have been another one in Chicago. Yeah. The, oh, okay. The, the, yeah. the, the legal case was to do with Tilted Arc, which was in New York. But he, oh, okay, he's had sorry, he's had yeah. picked, he's had pieces done all over the place. Yeah. 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 Um. Yeah. I, I I've always I've always been um quite a big fan of Sarah, and there's something um very tactile about those kind of like the the, the sheets of steel and the way they corrode and stuff. And it's oh yeah. Um. Yeah, I kind of I kind of love being around those because it's sort of got I don't know sort of maybe like a sort of post-industrial sort of um aspect to it an air to it yeah. Yeah. No, but exactly like it, the the sort of manipulation of natural processes. I mean I, I know it's sort of um it, it's a criticism in a way though of contemporary art the way that the focus on materiality um and people like for example even when it comes to Ge Gerhard Richter or even Kiefer, which you've written, who you've written about recently, was one of my favorite artists. Uh, I do notice that the sort of obsession over the materiality of the work of art, that in a way it's sort of like, um, it's a stand-in for what used to be the representation of, of value within culture, and within society, and within the sort of metaphysics of the work of art. That now it's like, you know, this material corroding in an open space that becomes like the, the work itself. So I guess a criticism would be, what do you make of the sort of materialist turn within the contemporary art world? If you could call it that. And the sort of like this obsession with materiality itself. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, I think obviously it comes in because then you, because if you lose a shared set of values, uh, a shared set of metaphysics and you, you hollow everything out um, in terms of, a figural content you don't have any mm -hmm. iconography anymore so what are you left with you're left with you're left with the the, the canvas the paint the plaster the paint the 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 metalwork um so in a way i mean it's kind of well what else are you going to talk about because you find that the problem is that once you start talking about colors and shapes then you're getting into aesthetics and um a lot of there's a lot of people who were very um, against that sort of thing because it it's just seems to be like a diversion. They don't mm. really believe in aesthetics because aesthetics means um, A, having shared values and B, relying on your own personal responses to art um, as opposed to having a political response to art. So I think that in terms of aesthetics, you find that a lot of people just completely reject that outright. Um, I, I once, like, I mean, I, I, as I mentioned in the in the cultural book, you know, I, I once read an entire book on contemporary art, and there was not a single sentence devoted to the appearance of any work of art, <laughs> nothing at all. It was just the artists, the ideas, references, literature, other stuff. It was never. I looked at this picture, and this is what I saw, and this shape in this re relation to this color or this figure in relation to this landscape or space, or there was nothing like that, nothing like that at all. Um, this is kind of, kind of scary. And in a way, I think maybe it probably comes from genealogically. It probably comes from like, you know, by the time you get to the seventies, you have like the minimalists, you have the erasure of the, of, of uh, the artist in the artwork, even within painting. Um, one of my favorite artists here in Canada is a, Takeo Tanabe out in Vancouver, where he was educated in New York, then he went back and he started doing landscapes and he would sort of try to do like a lot of these landscapes of Vancouver Island, of course, you know, the tradition of group of seven, but to do it in such a way with very pale washes to like not almost like not touch the sereneness of it. But he was, you know, he was getting that, he was you know getting that from Japan and elsewhere. But I noticed that like there was this turn where the hand of the artist, it's him or herself, I guess nowadays they're self, right? Um, but the hand of the artist becomes irrelevant to the work of art. And I guess, and, you know, found art does this as well. And people, have, you know, have done this very poetically, but it seems like now that's carried on in one way. And we'll get into like the, the woke political art eventually. But yeah, yeah, I guess it comes from that tradition, right? 
So yeah, I mean, there's this kind of like there's a, uh, an accelerated de depersonalization and dehumanization of work, um, and you find that a lot of p political commentators and so forth are quite keen to get away from that. But I have to admit that's not an area that I've followed up in any of my reading. Um, so, I mean, you, you'd obviously know a lot more about sort of like the transhumanist stuff and, yeah. um, you know, sort of post-humanist art and so forth. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's clearly, there's a great discomfort about, um, there's, a, there's a great discomfort about craft. You're expected to do yeah. something yeah. very, very well, but you're not expected to have any particular craft or to inherit any craft. Um, because I think the problem is that once you get into craft, you start naturally start talking about the nature of materials and the way to treat materials. And there is a good way to make art. And there's a good way to handle materials. There's a good way to, um, and and that and that comes from tradition. But tradition is only built up because it's lots of people doing the same thing again and again and finding that the right. same thing is always true. So of course, if you if you don't believe in tradition, if you hate tradition, if you hate um, that sort of limit that lineage as it were the craft lineage you've got to cut it off you can't you can't allow people to build up a craft especially a craft in an established form so you might have I, I talked about something like neurotic craft many many years ago I talked about the idea of a neurotic craft so you're allowed to be really really craftful and skillful about gluing globs of polystyrene together or, or sculpting mm. in dust but if you actually you know you started carving marble like that or if you started using paint like that they'd be just like oh you know that doesn't count yeah exactly yeah <laughs> no that's true i mean craft i think it, but it's making a comeback i notice like i i think because of digital art and other things i mean i notice um people people are starting to go back to things like printmaking in, in a traditional way and so forth and that it, you know, it really is, it really is quite something to see. I think people, um, this is why, I mean, the whole, like, art, I don't want to really get into it because like really what, what more can you say about AI art? Like it's, it's it, to me, I don't know. First of all, it's probably not real. Second of all, even if it is, I mean, people will always appreciate the sort of aura around the fine art and around the craft and the ability to, to create. I mean, it's, I don't know. I mean, let's just clear it out of the way because I know people they're gonna like be all frustrated. So we're gonna give them blue balls by not talking about it. But what's your what's your hottest take on AI? Go go ahead, my friend. Hottest take um, on AI. Well, my my <laughs> my thoughts are that it's not really art. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the, I mean, there is there is a problem if you're if you're looking at if you're judging things from the end product. You may you may end up with two pieces of of work, one of which is by a human and one of which is by a computer, and you um and you can't distinguish between them, or you actually prefer the AI without knowing. Uh and then of course, oh you know, you've trapped, you've been you've been caught, you know, you've been tricked. The turning test. <laughs> um but I, I, I don't know. I mean I would say there's all there's all sorts of things that you can like in the natural world. Um, you know, you can like you can like things um you know, for, you can like natural forms without them being sculpted. It doesn't necessarily um, entail that you you're automatically crediting that to a creator. Um, right. So, and, and I know that there was this big discussion in the in the idea of the the sublime um, mm -hmm. in the sort of the end of the 18th century, and there was talk about you know like it, is there any categorical dis distinction between natural forms and man-made forms? And I think that's something that we're coming, we're going to have to come back and think about mm -hmm. in relation to AI. Right, um, yeah. right. Because, but that's what I mean. Like that's that's where the distinction is blurred. Is it a phenomenon, not of nature, but probably something that lies between nature and technics? And is it created by a human hand because it's from a prompt, because it's guided? But then things in nature can be guided. There are chemical yeah. processes and so forth. So, yeah. Yeah, and and also you know, um, you know, also the ruin again. Come talking about the sublime and the the ruin is is the work of nature and man. So it's right. originally man made, and then nature comes in and does its stuff. And you could say, well, AI is basically assembling assembling a whole bunch of bricks that you've given it that it's seen, and it's deciding what what sort of shape these bricks could go in if it's being prompted to say, oh, you know, hey, 
build a tower, build a medieval structure, build a watchtower, you know, build a sort of a, a Persian, uh, a Persian, um, um, you know, a fu funerary oh. tower or whatever. A you know, Persian and miniature, but Star Wars. But well, build yeah, a tower, or, or, you know, yeah. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. But no, but that's what I mean. Like, I, it's, it is fascinating discussion, but I think it, it will only lead into sort of a form of like intellectual muggleheadedness, right? Like it's when it comes to actual artists doing actual things. I mean, the one argument I do think, which is quite interesting about like that is more pro AI I've heard from the right wing is that a lot of these illustration people, a lot of these like, you know, Zoomer MB kids with Wacom tablets that they're basically human AI engines anyways, only they're making AI furry, uh, whatever, you know, they're, they're doing some kind of fetish, illustration that is essentially an, could be an AI prompt. Those people will get cleared out very quickly. Um, so I don't know. What do you think of like the industry, if you will? Um, I want to get back to art education, but let's, this is, I know people, they want us to talk about this. So it's like, I'm, I'm being a slave to the audience right now. So, well, um, yeah. I think you should be asserting your heroic will and telling them that they should, they should bugger off to a different channel. <laughs> true, it could be. True, true, true. Maybe they'll, they'll go to the uh, the upteenth uh, art channel on YouTube that talks about AI art. But, um, yeah. So what, what's going to happen yeah. to the industry? Yeah, well, of course, I mean, it, it's... It, I think the first impact it's going to have is obviously amongst um, illustrators, yeah. um, book illustrators, record covers, as much as there are record covers, you know, um, oh, yeah. yeah, posters, uh, commissions, obviously, I think, you know, sort of commissions, artist commissions. Um, yeah, so obviously that's going to reduce um, what, what you, I mean, what you're going to have and you're going to end up like with a, situation where the artisans are going to go out of business and you're going to have but they're going to be called in to work work the looms in the new factories <laughs> they'll be in they'll be coming in to tinker with the ai and add a few things and you know remove an extra finger you know and yeah you know they, they will be brought here they will be brought in to touch this stuff up but obviously it's going to require a lot less work and there's going to be a lot fewer of them Oh, yeah. so you're you're going you're going to see a situation like sort of like the industrial revolution where you have all these people working away with their own looms in their own private houses working there you know like 12 hours a day or whatever and now a fewer number of them are going to be spending one hour a day in a in a factory just sort of making sure the machines are working okay and just walking along the line along the production line i, yeah, I don't know have, how that's going to play out yeah they'll they'll have to feed the constant uh need of um different and strange forms of graphic content for the goon caves of the future so the uh, virtual reality goon caves so <laughs> oh man it's gonna be brutal but i wanted to talk a little bit about eroticism before we get to that um so in your art education so now let's go from when you are out of university uh you're trying to find your own style um, what is that process like? I mean, I know this is the criticism people have of the art schools is that the sort of complexities of your own style and your own voice, but that gets lost. And it's mostly about, I mean, you're taking more of an art history concentration. And so when did you start even lecturing? Was it later on? Or were you still very much trying to make it in like the art world proper? Oh, you know, I, I went, I went straight out and I didn't do any writing or any talking at all. It was just, it was just making art and, mm. and selling pictures. And so I, you know, I, I went, you know, I went straight into um, having exhibitions and mm -hmm. what we did was there was a, someone called Martin Maloney and he set up his own, he came out of Goldsmiths and he set up his own gallery and it's basically in his own house. And it was called Lost in Space. And this was this just like a little terraced house in South London. And he just like, uh, he's, he had a couple of spare bedrooms and he had a, a living room and, a, a, <laughs> you know, a stairwell and stuff. And he just he just put his, his friend's artwork on the walls and he'd sell stuff occasionally. And so we did, we did like a knockoff version of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, we say so we, we, um, we had, ha had access to a house and basically we filled it full of, all our stuff and invited you know various prominent people to come and see and none of them came 
Oh my god! Oh, that's but yeah, you got to take your lumps though. That's the thing. Yeah, and we and we didn't and we didn't sell we didn't sell anything, and um, the only people who came were just kind of like our friends and relatives. Um, and I think even them, even they were a little bit embarrassed by the show. <laughs> But yeah, so so anyway, we we were go, we were we were going into we were going straight into making shows and stuff and and selling stuff and you know I worked with a bunch of commercial galleries, um, and they they all have fairly, um, they all had if you if you look down my CV you actually find there's a whole bunch of galleries there and I was moving between galleries because I wasn't selling that much and also the galleries were going out of business. Yeah. So I, I was just like, I, ha I had a show, had a couple of shows, sold a couple of pictures, doing quite well. Oh, let's set you up for another show. And then the gallery closes down and then you move to the next gallery and so on. So I was doing all of that straight away. Um, as far as finding my voice, I mean, I kind of knew what I was interested in. I always knew what I was interested in making. Um, so that wasn't so much of a problem. It was more a problem of finding an audience and making a living. And so I was doing that for um, 10 years. And then I moved to, uh, and then I moved to Berlin, mm. and that's when I started doing a lot more writing, because um, I didn't have any connections over in Berlin. Um, this is Berlin, Germany. Um, I didn't really speak the language, so I was kind of a little bit isolated. So what I did was I started writing art criticism, art reviews, giving talks, and so forth. Um, and that was that was great fun that was very productive and so at that point i was doing the art and the writing in tandem and that's that's carried on ever since yeah similar to me but i mean of course all this happened online um you sort of the more you produce the more you write it, it seems that nowadays the artist is obliged to write about their own cosmology if you will um, well, that, well that 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 came in very much in the 90s i mean we we were we were sort of schooled on how to talk about our art at goldsmiths it was very much a part of the education process so you went into these group tutorials and you'd be invited into this room and you know you'd have like three or four artists but student artists would put up work on the walls and you'd spend an afternoon talking about it and the artist would be forced <laughs> to sit right next to the pictures and they would smoke because this was a time when you could smoke in in art school and they'd be chain smoking and really nervous and sort of hunched over muttering away chain smoking you know, <laughs> the, the, the cigarette trembling in their fingers and they would try and explain what their what this sort of nonsense was that they put up on the wall and so you were and you were grilled and people asked questions and it would get quite competitive and quite quite confrontational sometimes you'd have to like people bursting out into tears or people you know threatening to fight other people or something and it was quite <laughs> glad to talk. so it was a, it was essentially sort of the prototype of the the internet sort of flame war um, yo man yeah uh, so yeah. so yeah but but you were encouraged to talk about it and to to think about things and frame things in terms of uh, words and also theory although a lot of us tried to evade the theory i mean i certainly did so yeah i mean that there was that was kind of starting up in the late 80s and early 90s already yeah, and then it becomes well. It's, it really is indicative, I think, of like the age of um, the artist is a self-contained unit in a cosmology within themselves, and they have to sort of speak about that, and they have to sort of explore their own world. And there's sort of uh, the critic, in a way, becomes not irrelevant, but the critic can no longer solidify like a movement because that's like sort of, you know after the sixties, that's all gone. Like well, the, the, the critics, the critics had kind of been cleared out of the room, even by the 1990s. Yeah. You had, we had, we had very few critics who were sort of. I I can't remember any art critics who were. I mean, you had some sort of art, art historians, had like people like Thomas Crow and stuff like that, but you didn't. We didn't really talk very much about um, about what about reviews that were appearing. Um, they didn't even seem to register very much. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the critics had kind of been cleared out by that stage. So the, um, that's 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 kind of uh, a weird thing that you know when I started out as a critic, there really you know I really wasn't in competition with anyone else because there wasn't very many people around. It, I mean, there were art reviews, there were more art reviews, yeah. and there were more newspapers and stuff. So it was still being published, but um, I don't think any of it made a real impression on me. So it was kind of like I was stepping into this field, and it's like there was. You know, it was really empty. There was no one else there apart from me. Obviously, that was, you know, my ego. That was my perspective. But uh, yeah. no, it's true. I mean, it, it's if you talk, if you like read about 
like for example the artists in new york in the 50s and 60s it was like they were huddled around those art reviews it's like the the oh, journals yeah, yeah. were like it was everything right to make it but now it's like i mean even nowadays I mean, you still have critics i mean you have you'll have like the big like towering pop critics like uh our favorite guy there in new york you know the one right <laughs> jerry salts um oh but, yeah 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 you know, but I mean, apart from that, I mean, basically the artist is reduced to being a critic as well, or at least being able to verbalize what they're doing, which some people think is terrible, like, you know, because it's 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 getting rid of the magic of it. But I don't know, like, I mean, maybe I'm just defending, like me and you were similar in that we're both artists and, and critics, but maybe I'm just defending our, our what we're doing. But it seems that it, it's a curse and a blessing in some ways that you can talk about your own artwork but then maybe you're robbed of that other perspective by someone who is more trained in the word rather than. Yeah. So, I mean, I've got, I've got a bit of that training because I did it at college, but yeah, I mean, I find that I'm noticing stuff in art that I think critics probably wouldn't notice. You notice when people mm -hmm. fudge stuff, you know, when people are covering up stuff, you know, when they, yeah. but also conversely, you know, when they've done something that's really difficult. Oh, yeah. And you can say, look, that, that that's really tricky. He's he's really he's really played a blinder here. Uh, but so the actual experience of making stuff makes you gives you a chance to sort of impart some of that knowledge uh, in your own review, uh, not just um, in terms of technical stuff, but sort of yeah, this is a real challenge, and he had to sort this out. But he he seems to have sorted this out, or he's kind of sidestepped it, or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, that that's kind of interesting because you you're 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 bringing extra information to the table that a critic wouldn't have yeah exactly yeah it's true even like i noticed like when i even review uh works by you know some of my favorite artists like the, you could see the steps that they were probably going through and and the way that they're approaching it um so yeah that that is very valuable whereas a critic i mean I frankly don't know why Jerry Saltz is that popular. Maybe he's been propped up by some very moneyed people in New York, but you know, I mean, we can only speculate. Um, I don't even think his insight is that particularly good though. That's the thing. That's the problem. Like if you're going to be a critic, be a good critic. Don't just, you know, I remember there was this one video uh, I talked about in a YouTube video where he was in Instagram and it, cause he's friends with Carol Dunham, by the way, he's best friends with him. So he was, um, going to an exhibition of Carol Dunham's new, um, which I quite enjoy the wrestler paintings, right? Because again, I'm a fan of pro wrestling. So um, I know the exact moves and everything. So he's going in there and of course they cleared out the gallery. So it's like clear out the God to like, it's very much an old school LARP of what the critic was where it's like, they're cleaning out the gallery for Jerry Saltz to come in there with his camera phone and like talk about, he's like white fragility of wrestling with white fragility. And it's like, you know, it's very much, it's almost like a delicious throwback to when the critic was a god, you know, in some ways, but yeah. Yeah, you, you can sort of feel like, yeah, you can sort of like, it's like as an old, as an old movie star who's kind of like hired, hired in sort of a, a cameraman for a day who's rented a camera and there's, there's just like a sound technician who's come in for the day and they're going to pretend to make a, an old style movie like they used to make, but no one's, <laughs> no one's, no one's going to come and see this version. No, no one's interested. Mm -hmm. yeah oh man so w let me i guess we've been going on for a little bit so let's talk about your own artwork I'm, I'm fascinated by uh your process and your figurative work and doing figurative work in a time where it wasn't it was sort of less popular but then it was still coming back in the in the late and early 90s it was you know there was still a room for it so yeah. i guess yeah yeah so so oh, well, well yes yeah. so, so the situation was in the in the early 90s when i was at college was there were there were very few painters because kind of everyone came in as a painter yeah and very few people left as a painter because <laughs> what would happen is you'd, you'd be forced to explain stuff and it's really difficult to explain stuff especially painting and you were asked, well, why is this a painting? Why does this need to be a painting? If this, if you're interested in this view, why don't you just take a photograph and and paste that photograph on top of a metal box or something? Yeah. <laughs> why, why, why are you automatically going to painting uh, or drawing? Because uh, because a lot of people came in as as draftsmen uh, yeah. and they they couldn't the drawing drawing wasn't taken as half as seriously as painting and painting was still at, still near the bottom of the stack as it were. I mean, you had lots of conceptual people there uh, teaching at college. Um, 
I know, um, you know, what one of the, the bigger names, of course, was Michael Craig Martin. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it wasn't con conceptual per se, but I mean, he was, he, was no, he was no painter. And so you'd be going into these tutorials and you'd kind of like, oh, each year you'd see these guys who'd come in as painters alongside you. And like now they were doing performances and it's like, oh, OK, goodbye, 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 friend, farewell. <laughs> um, and so I, and I, I just I just stuck with it because um, uh, it was what I liked doing. It's what I was uh, what I had some sort of feeling for. It's what I was good at. So I carried on doing it. And I remember um, that, that I was I was doing I was painting in lots of different styles. I was trying to be a little bit postmodern um, and it didn't it didn't really work for me or work for the ideas. And my tutor, Lisa Milroy, said, well, this is really inconsistent. You know, I, I, I like this aspect, but then you're doing this and then you want to do sculpture. And then you said you wanted to do these installation things with vitrines and whatever. What are you on about? You know, like this is this is all over the place. I need some consistency. Mm -hmm. And I was getting this from the group tutorials. You know, you've got to be more consistent. So what I did is I just sat down and painted a skull and then I painted another skull and then another and another. And they were all the same, same format, same paint, same image. And I said, you know, like, hey, you want consistency? I'll give you consistency. So I did it again and again and again. And it was just like kind of like me banging my head against the wall saying, look, I can keep banging my head against the wall. You know, you're not going to be able to stop me. I'm going to carry on doing this. I'm going to give you what you asked for. You asked for consistency. Here's your consistency. Oh. And so I ended up and I ended up with this wall of, you know, like 20, 20, basically the same painting 20 times. And I exhibited those. And that was the first mature work that I made. And that was that was really exciting because it was kind of had a force. And I was thinking in terms of um, Andy Warhol. You know, oh, yeah. like the, elect the electric chairs and all the, all the crash series, the accident series. And you'd have the same thing again and again. Um, not usually 20, but, you know, you'd have a few of them. And so that was it had an accumulated force. And I really liked that. Um, and so ever since then, I've been painting um, sort of potent images as much as I could. Uh, you know, like images that really struck me or startled me. So some of these would be found. Some of these would be combined. So different sources combined. Some of them would be from the imagination. Yeah. And I've carried on doing that essentially for the last uh, 30 years. So that that's that's what I've been doing. It's yeah. Like I think like with, with Warhol, like you were talking about like the electric chair, but also what's interesting is you're painting the same subject, the same skull in the same position, and they're each coming out slightly differently. Yes. I mean, that's why I really, you know, that's why I love printmaking, like intaglio printmaking, especially they all have sort of like a, a, a aura to them because with intaglio, you can never get it like hundred percent accurate. Right. So I always like the ability of having a, something that's repeating but something that is unique especially if people are buying them they're they're sort of like going out and it's like that's even though it's a multiple it still has a sort of authenticity to it um yeah i think i saw a picture of that uh on your website or somewhere your first yeah it's it's there. i i did i've done um i did a i did a silk screen print of it and it's mm. i think it's sort of 20 or 25 heads or something and it is yes yeah, 25 heads so it's five by five and each each one of the little each one of the little heads is individually drawn. Um, yeah, it's been it's yeah. been silk screened. But yeah, so that, again, that was the same principle. It's doing the same thing again and again. Um, and you you think, oh, this is crazy. This is just so boring. But then you're thinking, ah, oh, but I really like that eye. And I you know I like doing the yeah. little hook around the eye. And I want to do it again and again and again. It's, it's that Freudian the ple the pre the pleasure principle that Freud talks about, where you just when you're a child, you, you you find something that really excites you and you want just you just want to do it again and again and again. Obviously, that sort of relates to all sorts of other things. Um, and that's and that's kind of exciting. It's it's kind of it's 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 kind of vacant, but it's kind of meaningful as well. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what else, but the, that's what really fascinated me, because like even editing the multiple editing, the print is something that, you know, I, I was I learned from Gauguin like the way he would like do the different sequences of prints and he would like purposefully distort the color blocks. Like, I mean, of course, like in, in Japan, the UQE masters, they would, oh man, they would, you know, they would, <laughs> they would have a fit, but the way that you sort of paint different things onto them or put different color washes on them yeah. or have a print that's specifically 
designed to be vague to then fill yeah. in with color. Like and, I was and, always fascinated by that. Yeah, and, and also you had you had um, a, a, a move in the mid nineteenth century. You had a movement um, to do with etching, the etching yeah. revival in the mid nineteenth century, and they did uh, like heavy inking, really oh, heavy yeah. inking, and mm -hmm. you do creative inking. And there was one guy I can't remember his name. But he would he would do a landscape scene and he would ink it in a different way. So one way it would be like an autumn scene, then it would be like a winter scene, then it would be a summer scene. And this was just from inking. The, yeah. the essential drawing was no was not changed. But he was just um, you know, in that way, I think that goes a little bit too far, but <laughs> you know, it kind of but you know, I mean that like the monotype, of course, mm -hmm. is I mean that that's that's a that's because it there are two definitions of a print. So one is that it has to be reproducible, so there have to be multiples yes. of it. The other one is it has to exist um, on on the block, on the on the matrices. You know, it, it can't exist yeah. anywhere else. Whatever matrix um, you're using, yeah, yeah. So, and of course, on one level, the the monotype is it exists on the matrix and it's printed, it's transferred. So it, you have to use printing to make it. And then on the other hand, it's not reproducible. So right. is it a print or isn't it a print? It 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 fits one of the definitions, but it doesn't fit the other one. But clearly, it is a print or yeah, that's really exciting. Have you ever tried monotypes? Oh, I love monotypes. Yeah, I've, I've tried a bit. I want to get back into it, but I, I do acrylic and, of course, ink monotype um, on on plexiglass plates because I do I do a fair bit of plexiglass etching when I don't use copper. Uh, but, of course, like I'm, I'm mostly like with uh, wood cuts and, and wood engraving. I think wood engraving especially is like one of my things I love. I just I'm very passionate about. But with monotype, it's like I, I love it because... If it's thick enough, though, you could get uh, two, one or two ghost prints. I think. Yeah, one or two of them. But you know. yeah, and also you can you can do um, I can't remember what it's called, but there's there's the other one where you where you put the print through with another sheet of paper, and so you get like a ghost image there. So you get like Chincolet. a Chincolet. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you so you get so you get um another version, and I know that um, uh, Degas used to do two versions. He do he do the the, the straight monotype. The straight monotype and then they do but like uh they'd be like an echo version the sort of a lighter version which would go through and then he would go over with pastels so and that and that would become something quite different oh yeah um but he'd, he'd have the two yeah yeah um there's people even do it with paint um oh, who's that one australian artist that does the huge paintings of like uh what's his name starts his last name starts with a q where he'll, he'll like mash one canvas into the other one and he'll do like a negative print of it. And it's usually someone like, uh, like in a car accident or something or a face of that nature. Oh, I forget. Quin Quinny. I forget. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm no good with contemporary artists. So. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, but where, where did you, uh, I wanted to get into specific works, but what attracted you to the grayscale? Why the grayscale? Do you hate color? Are you, are you, yeah. An austere, like uh, Anglo artist, is that what? <laughs> <laughs> An Anglo artist. Wow. Color? Okay, that, that's a, that's a special level of insult. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, basically, I was. Um, well, that, that was the consistency thing. So I started mm. at college. It was like, you know, I was doing stuff in color, and I was doing drawings, and then I was doing etchings, and I was doing these paintings, and it's like, oh, we want consistency. How do you get consistency? You just use two colors. Yeah. yeah, you're never you're never going to run out of lamp black and, lit and titanium white. You're never going to uh, have any sort of doubts about oh, should I be using this kind of crimson or this, you know, this this yeah. sienna or do I want uh, raw sienna or burnt sienna or whatever? No, no, no. You just have you just have the two two paints. You just use those. You only use those. You only use those for years and years. I have worked in color, but maybe we'll discuss that another time. But right. so we had so I was had black and white, and I was working on the grayscale. And one thing is it's hugely consistent. The other thing it's very cheap. Oh, because I remember, I remember Frank Frank Auerbach saying, someone asked him why he only painted in brown, and he said, "Earth colors are the cheapest." When he started <laughs> out, Earth colors are yeah. the cheapest. So you know, you you can't afford ultramarine, yeah. you can't afford the you know the beautiful colors. So you you stick with like the, the the shitty colors. And so, and the third reason was I was working from a lot of black and white photographs. Yeah. So, so there were all sorts of reasons why. So there were basically three reasons why I was working black and white. And also I loved the effect of having, you know, I was because I was working this way essentially for like 30 years. So you can go through all of <laughs> everything that I've done and just pick out a painting from like three different decades and you can put them up on the wall 
and you won't know which decade they're from and they're going to hang together and you're not going to have a problem with um you know sort of uh, the evolution of my color use or whatever it's just going to be three pictures and they're going to interact perfectly and you can do a mix and match with anything that i've done pretty much um so so they so it works really well from a hanging perspective as well from a display perspective so the, the, maybe there's maybe there's four reasons for no but that's fascinating though because in a way you're sort of bringing a complexity you're almost obliterating your own genealogy in a way because it's like it's not like picasso it's like becomes this like meme of like the blue period the red period the, it's like but now it's like you're engaging with the whole body of your work is not subject to the same sort of like evolution or genealogy that people can figure the artist into of like this is my earlier period this is when joseph boy started doing like you know <laughs> found art or whatever it's like now it's like you can take one from 1997 and you can take one from 2007 and one from 20 hopefully 2027 uh and <laughs> you know and put them together uh yeah god willing right but I find that fascinating with the grayscale because, for example, your landscapes, when I look at them, they do have that austere northern quality to them. They're very cold. They're very frigid in a way. Well, I mean, the, the you know, the, the winter ones as well. But there's this one where you're doing this, like this abandoned castle. I remember looking at it and it was very like I could almost think of like very, very northern, very like Edvard Monk. And I uh, you know the one I'm talking about, right? The castle one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that that's some, that's something that I spent a lot of time thinking about. I was always very interested in snow painting and snowscapes, mm -hmm. um, also in nocturnes as well. I've never I never quite approached how 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 I would do a nocturne. It's, it's something that might be it might be an interesting subject for me to tackle. But yeah, so so I was I was really interested in um, paint uh, painting of snow. Um, also, it's quite exciting when you have a reverse, um, where you have like a light ground which is covered with snow, and mm. then you've got a dark, cloudy sky. That what it does is it inverts the normal way you see landscape because normally you see landscape with a dark ground and a light yeah. sky. If you reverse it, it's automatically exciting, it's automatically dramatic. Um, and that's something that I found sort of you know, it, it excited me to try and paint that again and again. And I was looking a lot at, you know, painting uh, paintings by Munch and um, Caspar David Friedrich and oh yeah, Caspar David Friedrich, other, yeah, other yeah. people, yeah. So and and I, I and that really stimulated me. And I I, I actually had this idea I was going to go to go and live in Norway. Um, as it happened, I only got as far as as Berlin because uh, mm -hmm. I was just basically going to go up north up to Norway. But I got to Berlin and I started, you know looking for for jobs uh, so i could support myself up in norway and i thought well i can teach english but the only problem is of course everyone in norway already speaks english who are you going to teach english yeah, they don't need you they don't they didn't need me so i never got any further north than berlin but um yeah I, i've got a got, got a great love for scandinavia no but it's true. i almost see like you could be a black metal album cover it could like you could but like when you but like you're seeing like the reversal of the image. Now the sky is the one that is filled with color. It's the most exciting that it immediately evokes sort of like um, the haziness of the landscape, you know, it, it becomes something different. The character mm. of it is different. It's very fascinating the way that you're approaching it. Um, well, so so, so yeah. well, something that really excited me when I went to Sweden, uh, Northern Sweden was that they said that, you're going to be really surprised by the landscape because when you get there, the air is so clear that you know you normally know you normally get this sort of aerial haze. You get a blue haze at mm -hmm. a distance because of the particles in the air because there's dust yeah. in the air or water in the air. But you go to a place where the air is clear enough, and it's shocking. the The horizon is almost as dark as the land that you're standing on, so it's a real, real compression. Um, and that was quite exciting to see. Um, it's a difficult thing to paint, oh, yeah. um, but it's a it's an exciting thing to see because it doesn't look as convincing. As yeah, it doesn't doesn't look as convincing. It, it, look, it looks yeah. as though you've 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 kind of like you've you've temporarily lost <laughs> the ability to paint distance in landscape because it's of course it's so easy. The Italian painters could do it by sort of thinly veiling, you know, like the Leonardo paintings and the Raphael paintings got these tiny little mountains at the distance. They're tiny blue, yeah. just just like a little smudge. It's it's like the the painter you were talking about earlier. 
Um, but of course, you try and you, you you can't do that up in the north because it's so clear and it's really crisp and it's dark, and it it, it looks it looks odd to us. Um, I, I guess that you're up in you're up in Canada, so you're kind of like halfway. You you, you get to see oh, yeah. a bit more. Yeah, I mean, even like the details of the landscape, like the mountain in the background, it's it almost is like it forces you to paint in some ways amateurish because an an amateur landscape painter would like won't have the distinction between the details of the background and the foreground. And so, but it forces you to do that, which is very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got painters like, um, uh, Harold Solberg and, um, how is it? Uh, Astrup, N Nikolai Astrup, uh, who are two, um, Norwegian painters also to, to a lesser degree monk as well. They yeah. they do that. They do that thing of the really, you've got really bright, strong colors for something that's up against the horizon and it just seems sounds weird it seems like a yeah. like a stylistic affectation of the norwegian why would they do this 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 must be their national style no 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 it's to do with realism it's to do with the way you see things because the air is so clear there um yeah and that's that's something that you only notice once you've actually been there and seen it for yourself yeah very interesting is i mean starkly different from the english landscape yeah absolutely I mean, you yeah. know i mean between turner and wasson and the watercolorists like it's it's all about i think that's why watercolor really took off in england because it was like about the haziness the dinginess the, the rain the way you could get yeah the, 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 the rain the fog yeah. um yeah it's absolutely i mean it's a, it's the quintessential english way of painting it's actually something that i've not done very much mm. um i feel a little bit I feel a little bit guilty that I haven't. I've done like ink washes and yeah. stuff, uh, working in one color, um, but I've not. I've not done very much uh, watercolor work, and I've not done very much sort of um, water. Um, I've done drawing out in the landscape, but I haven't done painting out in the landscape. Mm -hmm. I think that's something I would like to try in future if I have enough time. Well, I mean, there's a hundred things that you want to do if you had. If you had me the too, a hundred percent, hundred percent. I wanted to talk about your approach to the figure and the nude, but there was one painting I'm dying to ask you about because it really struck me was um, Boy C. I believe it was called Boy, then C. Yeah. I believe you did this. Version in, C, yeah. Version C. Did, was this around 2001 you did this or so? Yeah, um, it was let me look it uh, 90. I think it was, the, there were three versions, A, B, and C. I think it was virtually... From ninety eight to about two thousand. Ninety eight to ninety nine, yeah, two thousand. Yeah. yeah. So what happened was I had uh, I found an image of um, a boy standing up against a. Um, it's actually it's uh, it's a concrete um, a pillar that supports a street lamp. So it's a street lamp pillar, but of course it, it looks quite sort of stone like or wood like. And what I've done is I painted him and I've erased the face. Yeah. Um, and that that painting that you talked about, the version C, that actually was bought by the National Lands the National Museum of Wales in Cardiff. Ooh, so it's actually nice. in a serious museum. Um which was a great honor. Um yeah, so that that was that was kind of like a th that painting actually was really, really tricky because I, I thought because I know I, I know I'm going to erase the face, and I've done the two other versions. So version A is quite small, version B is slightly larger. C is the largest version, and I erased the face, and I thought, oh no, man, I've, I've gone too far. There's just too much. There's too much liquid. It's, it's too much. It's too watery. Yeah. I um I'm going to have to scrape it off and repaint it, and I was just like, oh damn. And and I and I went away and I was kind of like I, I felt like oh, I I blown it. I'm gonna have to next time I go into the studio, I'm gonna have to sort it out. And then when I went back in, it's just like, wow, actually, ooh, that that works. It's just on the edge of being too much, but it's just enough. Yeah. Yeah. But what I really like about it, like even looking at it, is that in, in a way, it, it implies a sort of a history that is being erased. Like, like it's very much quintessential, like England, Wales, Ireland. Like it's very much, you could see like the coal, the coal mining towns in the background and they're sort of receding in the background, of course, because, because Maggie killed them. Maggie, I can't believe you got rid of the coal mines. Yes. But it's very much like it, it could be um, a lot of British music as well as kind of like that. Like one of my favorite bands is Porcupine Tree. They have a lot of this sort of like very somber songs that talk about like growing up and sort of like you know those council flats and so forth and it reminds me of that sort of 
the pull into history because you don't re- know if it can be a boy that is in the seventies or in the nineties or so forth. It just, of course, like I, I always painted like faces figures cause I was terrible at faces at the time, but you know, I mean, so it's compensation for lack of skill. It's a skill issue. But what I really loved about it, because then you also have the pillar that is a monolith of that history. And so was that your thought process when you immediately saw that image? Was it, was it implying like, it's something very, very like in English about it, I guess. You could yeah. Say. Yeah. yeah. Cause, cause it's a guy, it's actually a boy in school uniform and you can see kind of mm. like his shirt's a little bit untucked. That's so, you what know, it he's, is. He's, yeah. a little, he's a little bit scruffy. He's, 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 this is a working class area. You can tell by the types of houses that are in the background. They're not very detailed. There's a, there's a car parked on the street, yeah. you know, it doesn't look like anything special. And it, and it, and it very much is. It, I mean, it very, it struck me as a very quintessentially British scene. I, I, I can't, I don't actually know the origin of the photograph, but it, it struck me uh, very powerfully. And you've got, you've got the, the, the lone figure up against the armature and, you know, it, you know, religious people, forgive me for saying it, but it, it reminded me of a crucifixion. You know, you've, got lo- 100%. You've, got, yeah. you've got the lone figure up against the armature raised, isolated in a public space. No, and no it's hiding. in the middle of the piece, though. It's in and the it's in the middle of the picture. Of the picture. It's, it's absolutely yeah. central. You know, it's like it's like the center of a triptych. Um, yeah. So that that was something that really struck me. And I thought, oh, as soon as I saw that, I thought, I can I can use that. I can use that. I know what to do. Yeah, I know that, that feeling when you see an image, right? You you just have to do it. Like it's yeah. But no, but that but that's really funny because it it does imply sort of the crew, like, which I guess is your your latest book is like this sort of crucifixion of history itself that is being erased. And the, like what, but what guided you towards the faces figures or the figures that have been where the face is obliterated And this? Why is there such a, I know I'm going to like immediately, I think of like, you know, Deleuze and faciality, but why is there sort of like a deterritorialization of the face, the erasure of it? What, what, like even your nude figures, they're looking away or they're from behind. Um, and I want to get to the nudity eventually, but why, what guided you towards the decision to distort and erase the face? A lot of, a lot of contemporary artists do this, but with you, I mean, the fact that you're doing this gray scale and you're using older photos, it inherently implies like memory. That's what I get. Like memory and history is such, so integral to your artwork. I mean, from my perspective, I'd be totally wrong. I'd just like, I could just be like, being a, no, a word cell you're, right now. You're, but, you're yeah. right. That that old warhorse mortality <laughs> comes out. It comes trotting out I and mean, yeah. sort of stomping out slowly. Yeah, it's because it, it's it's to do with memory and loss and things passing away. And you know, obviously, some of the photographs, some of the source images I was getting were from newspapers, and yeah. they were like from obituaries. And they're basically, I was just sort of cutting. I was just flicking through, and you you get a photograph of someone who was well known in the 1960s or something and they died and of course they were just sort of repro- there was a photograph of them in their prime so you're getting a photograph of someone in from the 1960s or 70s or something or you know sometimes you i'd read um articles on you know great writers and they'd have a photo and they'd have some photographs of them just sort of sitting around in a sun lounger in you know 19 1930s oxford or whatever and so you'd end up with these these sort of little clippings and you can tell by the clothing it's not now it's sort of edwardian or it's 1930s or 1950s or something mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so you've got you've got that aura of something past and of course you know logically speaking that of course these people are gone and of course temp- temporarily speaking they're kind of they're kind of gone the next year anyway they're wearing different clothes they're in different places that was another summer that was in the past but um they they they're sort of forcefully cut off by the by the caesura of of death right and yeah so the the erasure of faces is, is very much to do with mortality and also to do with being cut off from tradition so i wanted to do kind of portraits but i wanted to do them in the most indirect way possible not in an ironic sense not in a sort of postmodern ironic sense but like right, right. i really wanted to do them but i didn't know how to do them i didn't know if i if i could do them if i could do portraits straight Maybe they just done that taut, corny, or like like I was kind of refusing to be in the place and time where I am now. You know, maybe you can't do a, a, 
with just a face now. Maybe it's not possible now. If you're mm. if you're a thinking conscious artist in the year two thousand, you can't do it. Yeah. So I was like, well, maybe I can maybe I can do it indirectly. So I can do like an unportrait. So it's a portrait that has everything of the characteristics of a portrait, except the face. Right. So it was kind right. of like it's kind of like a a riddle. And and maybe I don't know. Maybe I was just trying to be too clever, but. I always thought that the best pictures had a kind of emotional potency. Um, and that was, that was exciting. And also, I know I noticed something also growing up in the 1980s, you'd have uh, documentaries on Northern Ireland. And one of the characteristics of Northern Ireland, which was very divided then and, and still is to a degree now, they would have murals on the wall of. Yeah, Hitler that's right. From yeah. the nationalist side. Uh, which is the Irish Republican side, and then the Unionist side, which was the sort of the, the British side. Ulster Cavalry, yeah. Yeah. So, and they'd have they'd have uh, basically iconic icons of their of their heroes or of soldiers or of you know freedom fighters or whatever you know however you want to phrase it, and um, and of course every so often, you know, the, the people from the other community would go out with a paint bomb. And they, yeah, and they, they could do faces, the faces yeah. and they'd erase the faces. So, like yeah. the erased face and the brick wall and the sort of the rundown 1970s appearance of a of a town, for example, in the painting boy version C that we talked about, that was so redolent of me growing up in the 1980s and think and just absorbing the 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 strife of Northern Ireland. Um, and that was kind of like characteristic of the period. I think anyone growing up growing up in that time will have had similar impressions. So it was kind of like, how can I make a painting that has the same charge as that? Uh, and that's what led me to do what I did. Because when you very fascinating, because when you when you think of like the history of Britain in in the seventies and eighties, the face becomes the subject of collapse and terror and erasure. You have the fate, like the sort of balaclava face of the IRA, you know, soldier, freedom fighter. You have the the smutted face of the last coal miners going down before Maggie, like Dove Fielding, before like Maggie Thatcher yeah, closed yeah. them. Yeah, it's like very, it's fascinating though. Like the in the sort of, of course, like I mean, you can make like a more of a, a sort of left wing art critic critique of like this is a picture of middle-class domesticity being erased and, 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 you know, being subjected to greater forces of both uh, political extremism, but also economic extremism in a way. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe you'd be, be adverse to that analysis because. No, I mean, you know, I think, I think people are welcome to come in with all sorts of analysis. I mean, it's not, yeah. it's not for me to say there's something, there are some interpretations that resonate more and some that resonate less, of course, but it's, yeah. um, I, but I think the importance of the picture is that it has, power that it has an emotional strength that you remember it i think the most something that people kind of forget the most important quality that art can have is to be memorable yeah and i think that if if more artists today considered that and held that as their kind of the central core of what they did and how they judged work i think that would completely change change their their creative process 100 percent, yeah but but even when you do um, do the faces though I mean for example um, just those little details you're very good at this where those subtle details will really create an impact like there was this one I was looking at forgive me I, I didn't see the title but it was a little girl like she's looking down Oh yes, older yeah. photo. what's the title of that one? Uh, so I think I think that's just like I call that one girl yeah, Sometimes it's girl. it's untitled, but yeah, I mean, essentially, it's it's a painting of a girl. It's a girl wearing a, a long black dress, and yeah. she's kind of got like a little white collar, but there's only half of the collar showing, um, and it's it's slightly unbalanced because um, you can see you can see the sort of the cut off of her sleeve on one side, but you can't see it on the other, um, and also if people people can find this image it's, it's out on my website which is alexanderadams.art oh yeah i'll um, put all the links in the description yeah excellent yeah so what you'll find is actually if you look there's a black bar running behind her but actually the black bar is a slightly different height on each side yeah and this gives a sort of and also the she's off center she's off to the left and so it gives you a sense of like kind of like gets under your skin because it's kind of unbalanced mm -hmm. And it, it it feels you know it's there's not symmetrical it, it 
you just what you just want to kind of like reach in and, and move her to the center or something. Yeah, yeah. But the fact that she's off, off to the side, though, and the, to me, that's very significant because the way I interpreted it when I was looking at it is that the way that she's looking down in this very brooding manner, it's like, again, not to go, not to go all, you know, uh, feminist art critic, but you can almost see like that she's being oppressed by a certain force of quiet desperation, of domesticity, of the fact that there is it still implies memory and it implies trauma It implies all these different things. The fact that she's, she looks older than a little girl. It's like one of those sort of photos of like, um, you know, children that have been through like, like the children of poverty, for instance, you find in the great depression or whatever there's, impl there's implying a sort of, but of course she's like, it implies typically like British middle-class, you know, very caged, gelded cage existence. And the fact that she's looking down in this brooding manner, uh, and, and she's off to the center. She's being displaced into the corner of a room. It's like, I felt like I, I felt for her in a way. I felt like, oh my God, like this is terrible. But the way you managed to capture that emotion, I mean, were you thinking of all those things? I'm assuming it comes from a photo of a, of a little girl. Yeah, right, it was, right? yeah, it was from a, well, I mean, the, 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 the image of her face and her shoulders came from that. I mean, I kind of extrapolated. Yeah. It wasn't off center. I think it was just a tiny little detail from a m magazine that I found. Uh, I think it's a Sunday supplement that. Um, yeah. For, 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 for younger listeners, I should explain that a Sunday supplement <laughs> was where they have a newspaper that comes out every week, and then at the weekend it comes out, and they have like a, a magazine section that comes with it. So, mm. and this came from one of those, and yeah, and I was. You're exaggerating it, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm exaggerating. I'm manipulating. I've, everything I do is, has been manipulated. It's been changed. I've reduced details or I've added things. That, so it's, it's never one for one transcription. So, yeah, when I was looking at that, I was thinking, well, she looks incredibly vulnerable. And you're thinking, you know, oh, I feel for her. Vulnerability. You know, what, vulnerability. That's the word. I you know, and, 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 you know, but then at the same time, she seems extremely, you know, a little bit sinister. And in some ways yeah it's, it's like something yeah. out of a horror movie you know you like you'd, yeah. you you know like you'd, you'd expect her to suddenly look up and then suddenly you know like sort of you'd have the big scare big jump scare you know like you have the orchestral sting <laughs> um so yeah you can see I mean, the georgia Leggy score in the background <laughs> yeah you'd, you'd, you'd have some sort of you know sort of jarlo sort of like color filter over it and uh um yeah, like I, the I, ring. I, I, it's like the ring looking at you. The yeah, ring. so I'm, I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of exaggerating, but yeah, I mean it's, it's got it's got a it's got a potency because it's got an ambiguity, or or it's got at least two layers. It's got the the vulnerable layer, the the sort of the you know the the sense of vulnerability of 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 um of of distance of being isolated of possibly being abused or something, and then on the other hand, it's got this sort of quite very reserved very maybe knowledgeable or sinister or um something with great power yeah something like that i'm I, this is difficult to explain but you know i i feel like it operates on both levels and that was something that immediately excited me that i knew that this was this was the sort of image that i wanted because it had that effect on me and if i could paint it properly i could convey that and enhance it and transmit it to the viewer yeah yeah 100 percent. it needs to be an album cover i feel like it could be a very powerful one well yeah. it's uh, offers offers available but also <laughs> i'm going to be making a lithograph edition of that particular image oh so, I, funny i brought that up i didn't even know that what yeah was... yeah because because i hadn't told you i, I actually i'm planning to do a, a lithograph um at the end of this month which is we're recording this in april 2023 and it's going to be my first lithograph for 20 years or actually 30 years Oh. Yeah, so 30 years ago, I did my first lithograph and it wasn't very good, but I enjoyed the process. And so now I'm going to go and make a new lithograph and it's going to be of that image. I'm uh, just going to do an edition of uh, 50 nice. um, and working directly on the, stro on the stone. They're going to they're going to scour the stone for me. Give me the give me the crayons and the touche um, ink and I'm going to going to draw it out. Um, and that'll be yeah, that, that's going to be exciting to get into that. Oh, nice. Very nice. I've I've. I, I think it was going to try kitchen lithograph, but of course lithograph is one of, I mean, it's still one of the um, few print mediums left that has like a very restricted barrier to entry just because of the equipment. 
involved in yeah it's it's yeah. it's the it's the least available especially stone lithograph and plate lithograph yeah. to a degree but uh, often you find that what's happened is now that they're so used to doing i mean they, they did this back in the early 20th century i mean like bonnar and picasso and, and matisse did it it was basically you had a transfer sheet so they had a particular kind of um um sort of i think they use mylar now but it used to be some sort of waxed waxed paper yeah. and you draw on the wax paper and you send through the you roll it up and you post it to the litho lithograph lithographer they bond it to the stone and then they run off their edition and so um it was kind of not absolutely pure printmaking which is where you go in and you work on the matrix matrix yourself yeah. this was kind of like a an all it was almost that um, but yeah, so a lot of the stones and the presses are really hard to find. You'll find them in some of the more traditional art schools. Um, but I really, I really like the experience of um, working on those, and I, I love printmaking as well. So, oh, yeah, me too. Um, so I'm really excited to get back and uh, to do a print of this one. Do you do any physical printmaking? Or do you any intaglio or woodcut? Uh, I, or... I last time I did some uh, a few years ago. I did some liner cuts. Oh, um, nice! Yeah. Um, and if anyone follows me on Twitter, um, it's one of my liner cuts. There is my profile picture at the moment. That will probably change at some stage. But yeah, that was a, that was a liner cut. Um, I, I really like the the physicality of making the image, and also because it's you're having to think in reverse because of course yeah. you're, you're subtract you're subtracting in this in this case you're subtracting so that you're what you're doing is you're kind of drawing the white areas rather than drawing the dark areas yeah. and also you know if, if you do any sort of com complicated sort of multi-stage printmaking like etching or whatever especially um aquatint of course you're having to work back in reverse so you're having to think about the lightest areas first and then going darker and darker and darker yeah. whereas naturally if you're doing like a a drawing you would draw an outline and then you'd kind of like add a little bit you and then you get more delicate and more delicate and more delicate um yeah. uh so so you're having to think in reverse it's kind of like sculpting where you're you've got a block and you've got to think about all the positive material that you've got to extract um you have to be this, careful to carve away the material yeah exactly yeah yeah i mean of course you know being a printmaker myself of course is the little uh not that i would ever do this but there's little tips and techniques for wood glue that you could use to, you know, to uh, put in a special line of cut. Yeah. Fudge, fudge certain things. Yeah. 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 Um, but we don't do that. Of course we're purists. I mean, I'm a purist, so I, I don't do it. Um, what you see uh, is what you get, but you're a postmodern no, purist. Hmm. That's your, your trick. I know. I very, I know, I know. I, it, I'm slipping tradition through the back door. I guess that's the ultimate. Um, um, but before we get into the politics, one last thing uh, I wanted to talk about, well, with your artwork particularly not, but of course, I mean, I don't know, maybe we could just talk more about your artwork because I'm fascinated. But your Berlin show in 2012, the nudes. Um, I, I love how again the facial erasure, but then some people would say, given the context of the nude, though, that they're raunchy, they're exploitative, they're sexist. You could see everything about them, but I quite love them. They're the fact that they do have an air of raunchiness to them. What was your motivation doing the show in Berlin with uh Nude figures. I, I think you you um was it again uh about Edvard Munch or was another artist you were paying tribute to? No, well, well what it was happened was that I'd done all these uh, square nudes and there were a lot of them were basically from but again we're gonna have to transport your listeners back to the time when before the internet. So mm. when um when people wanted to get hold of anonymous partners. Right. One of the things they would do is they would take photographs of themselves or their partner and post them, post them into a magazine, something called a contact magazine, which would have <laughs> yeah. a photograph of, I mean, I mean, basically you'll find this on the internet, but it's basically yeah. a photograph of the person, you know, female, 26, um, vital statistics, lives in this particular area, looking for dot, 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 you know, they fill in what they, what they want etc and then there's some sort of p.o box that you write to or there's a telephone number that you phone and leave a message or whatever and it was all anonymized and one of the things that's characteristic of these magazines which i, I don't know if they still exist but um they they used to put these bars over the graphics over the eyes so you couldn't 
see the eyes and so theoretically you couldn't identify the person from their yeah, face. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And so I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to do this series of nudes and they would be modern nudes in a sort of Degas style, you know, trying to, because he was painting the modern working woman and it was considered quite sort of shocking and, oh yeah, you know, to, to subversive, to, and... subversive to show these women at work and these prostrating and stuff. It's just, it's terribly degrading and stuff, but I, I didn't see it that way. But so I wanted to do something like that, but I wanted to do it with a modern age. So I wanted to do it with people sitting on sofas or on sagging couches or, or on weird on carpets with, horrible horrible designs or i want them to sort of have wristwatches on and be looking at their mobile phones and have a packet of cigarette next to them and to make it completely modern but also try and have some degree of beauty some yeah. degree of voluptuousness to, they to, are very to, voluptuous yeah. to, to to some of them i mean some of them are just downright grotesque but some of them I mean, many of them are quite beautiful and i, I did some of men as well so yeah. Um, so anyway, I did the whole bunch of these pictures and basically they were just so extreme. No one, no one, no gallery would touch them. And I kind of like didn't really want to show them to anyone because no one probably would buy them. So anyway, but then I was in Berlin and Berlin's supposed to be a famously liberal city, especially. To oh, the set. very much so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell that to the Berlin girls. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't share any of that with me. I can tell you. <laughs> But anyway, so so I had all these all these pictures, and I thought, you know, I've got this gallery, and you know, I could do it. I could I could show this stuff, and I did, and it was kind of it was kind of exciting just to show these pictures of um, these uh, square pictures. That I, they were all sort of square format. Um, there there were some other pictures as well that I showed at the same time uh, of other nodes. But yeah, so showing these square pictures was kind of exciting because. Um, I didn't know. I didn't know what sort of reception they got. I got they got pretty good reception. They didn't sell, of course, but you know. They, uh, and uh, one thing that I did was, um, I had a little box, and I said, "Post your photograph here. If you post it at the beginning of the show, I will do a painting of what you put in the box." Wow. Now, obviously, you're you're kind of opening yourself up to all sorts of obscenity and whatever. But yeah. they were they were very restrained. They only put in proper pictures, mm -hmm. and I would do a picture painting from one of these photographs and put it up on the wall at the end of the show so you could actually become part of the show so it's interactive wow. it's it kind of, it kind, of a, kind of a gimmick but it's kind of a nice gimmick so I, I got like three or four photographs um and they're actually kind of interesting um and so so i did i did i did paintings and yeah and and they were actually went up on the wall on the last couple of days of the show um which was kind of kind of fun, um, yeah. So anyway, that's 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 how that show turned out. But were you working mostly from photographs, or are there nudes that you do like in the flesh of life drawing? And the the life the life drawings, uh, most of the life drawings are um, from life. Uh, hmm. So so they are they are me with a model. So sometimes I'm part of a group, or sometimes I'm working on my own. It's just me and the model, and you know, 10, 15 minute poses, yeah. and so I can only do the outline. And you have to be really. It's re it's really technically difficult to to try and get that right, in a fixed space of time, and get all the proportions right. And you can't really make any changes at all. And to get that done, it's that's that's the the biggest technical test I think I've ever had is just to be able to draw accurately and beautifully just with an outline, no shading at all doing a whole figure in 10 minutes that's yeah. really difficult yeah uh, but the the paintings the paintings now are not not done from life the paintings are done from photographs the drawings are fo from photographs or from life have you ever drawn any uh lovers or any of that like i know uh lucian freud that was his famous uh you know he had to have said whoever he was painting at the time so uh, well yes know. yes Yes, he yes he did. I think it was kind of like one of his stipulations. Um, although probably not for Kate Moss. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not, not sure that even Kate he. Moss. Not even yeah. he would 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 quite dare that. Uh, yeah. So some sometimes they're of um, lovers. Um, mostly they're not. Um, yeah. I've made a point of not I not identifying anyone in the square pictures. So if you see a square picture, you just don't know. You don't know where it's come right. from. So some of those are actually from. Yeah, so some of those are from contact photographs from magazines. Sometimes they're images that people gave me, and a handful are actually of um, girlfriends 
So mm. yeah, they're they're in there, but I I don't identify any of them. So I just leave it to your imagination to kind of guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like I remember one time a few years ago uh, I was talking about this with Matthew uh, Matthew Stout because he was drawing these uh, cam girls, and I thought that was quite interesting to sort of beautify what is meant for like mass production. In, in, like for lack of a better term of solidity, which is the cam girl. Yeah. You know, it's something that's very like nowadays in the age of only fans. I mean, back then you had to work for t- like, you had to work to be a pervert back in the day. Like if you watch older documentaries about alternative lifestyles, uh, but nowadays it's, it's so ubiquitous that to try to take something that is meant for lack of a better term, industrial output, uh, you know, like, an, like a cam girl and to, um, make beautify them in a way that like the way the picasso would take profit. like do you have any though ethical qualms though i mean that's such a stupid question though I, I wouldn't even want to ask it but i guess do you think of it in terms of quality in terms of the way that um embodied being within quality is is related to the work of art and the female nude are you thinking through these things or does it come just like I'm painting a nude from a back page well um, you know yeah yeah yes and no i mean the first thing is that pretty much i think everything's essentially got consent because it's out there right now obviously the the route that stuff gets out there is not always is not always straightforward and does not always involve consent but you know essentially these are through either things that have been published or these are things that have been people have agreed to give me yeah. or they're things that i have done with a, a girlfriend or with a model um so yeah so c- consent is kind of like uh, a component of all of those um uh yeah what, what was the other part of the question i guess the way that you approach the female nude and and what your motivations are and i i know the answer of in terms of like it is eternal standpoint of beauty especially in the western world in the occident it becomes the height of heavenly beauty is the female nude mm. i mean People can disagree. I mean, there's a lot of trads I would disagree. But I guess when when you're painting them, they're and some of them, like a lot of women that I've drawn, that I've even painted, they're not what people would consider conventionally beautiful. But they have a sort of a, a grace to them, even though they come from like less than stellar sources. Even the ones that do look very raunchy and very, you know, the celluloid is everywhere. Um you make them in such a way that they do come up like Dega or like Monk or, or like um, I'm trying to think like, like sort of like the, the, the nude in the, like the 19th and 20th century becomes something different. There's a transformation there. And now there is sort of a space. I mean, nowadays it's, it's the obsession. It's part of my book is like, you have painters, like as much as I admire her, I, I do love her work. People, you know, painters like Jenny Savile, um, like the female body is something a less than conventionally attractive female body now becomes something that is monumental or can have a beauty within the work of art. So are you thinking through these things? Is this like your consideration? Yeah. Yeah. Else? Cause obviously, you know, you're, you're thinking, I'm thinking back to sort of Rodin and Degas and Bonnar yeah. and, you know, all the way, all the way back to the Greeks and so forth. Yeah. And you're in your thinking, and and of course this is a constant thread. It's it's perhaps the only, apart from the human face, it's the only constant really all the way through, from ancient times up till now. Yeah. So if you if you want to measure yourself up against the greats, and I think if you're an ambitious artist, you do, you do think of this thing. And maybe you don't say it out loud, but you know, I I think about these things. I want I want to, I want to be you know, when they write art history, I want to be up there with the best of them. And so you're thinking, well, yeah. And you're thinking, well, okay, I want to see if I can do something for the female nude in the way that Degas did and the way that Rodin did and the way that Rubens did. Um, yes. And I, and I want to see if I can do it here and now, including all those accoutrements of um, modern life, which are kind of like, shabby and, and and embedded in your time so things like yeah. the, the the clothing the the the, the decor the, the the mobile phones which are now sort of like 20 years out of date and stuff you know hmm. all of that stuff and pin it down but have it with a figure that has a degree of grace and beauty and corporeality that 
the ancient Greeks would appreciate. Thank you for listening to the Content Minded Podcast, where every Wednesday there are interesting guests, amazing ideas, solo streams, and discussions on a diverse array of topics from art, philosophy, history, and more. The free version will be available both here on YouTube and as a downloadable link on Anchor and Spotify, as well as on Substack. Each week, the full, uncensored, and spicier version will now be available on both Patreon and Substack, where you will have access to the full archive of both Content Minded and of Giant Reviews, where I break down interesting texts every week, including other exciting paywalled articles and good content. Thank you all. Please like, share, and subscribe. God bless. Goodbye. Help keep the content renaissance alive. Too sweet.